tell me, what does democracy look like? It can be hard to see sometimes that an idea, a voice, a vote can make a difference. Each of us has the power to turn a moment into a movement. This is what democracy looks like. It's the power to dream of new solutions. The power to look at the world and say, we can make it better. The power to challenge outdated beliefs and right current wrongs. It's music and marches and murals to memorialize and move us forward. The power to use our voices, our platforms, our passion. The power to organize and protest and demand change. The power to be unafraid. Tell me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello, and welcome to Your Vote is Power, Power in Action series. Hand claps, wave your hands. I can't see you, but hey. <laughs> My name is Chris Percy. I'm the training director here at Move On. Um, as people are joining into the chat um, from around the country, just go ahead and let's get to know one another. So please share in the chat your first name, your pronouns, where you are viewing this series from. Um, again, that's your first name, your pronouns, and where you are viewing this series from. I shall start. My name is Chris, uh, he, him pronouns, uh, and I'm from the west side of Chicago. So, hey, everybody. So glad that you're here. Um, whether it's supporting a candidate fighting to pass progressive legislation, or working to change this world into one that we can all thrive in, Move On members are committed to an inclusive and progressive future. So whether this is your first time joining us ever, and you're like, what, what is this? Who are these people? Or whether you are a regular member who gets all of our wonderful emails and texts, who are already connected, uh, I am glad that you are here tonight. Welcome to you. I'm so glad that you're here. We have a dope, great, wonderful program planned for you today, and I'm so excited to dig in. Uh, we are going to uh, really have an excellent time today. We have some folks from the cast of Hamilton. Uh, yay, Hamilton, room where it happens. That's where I want to be. Um, and we have so many more folks um, as well uh, as a surprise at the end, so stick around. I am so glad that you're here with us. Now, as we dive into our program, I would like to first introduce uh, one of my wonderful colleagues who has been with me through Thick and Thin through these uh, uh, different series, uh, Kenya Leon, who is one of our training consultants and workers who has just led us so far and so much great work. Hey, Kenya. Hey, Chris. Great okay. to be here. Good to see you. Um, and I am so glad that our next guest is here. We had such a great time with him uh, last month. If you joined us for our Mobilize to Win training series, you've got a taste. Or if you're somebody who's at all connected in the world, you've probably gotten a taste and seen him on many different outlets. Uh, please welcome the co-founder of Crooked Media, co-host of Pod Save America, and host of Love It or Leave It. That's great. I see what you did there. Okay. Mm, sure. John Lovett. 
Thank you so Hi. much for being here. What a oh nice introduction. If you yeah. basically, I like that. I like I like the idea. I don't think it's true that like if you're connected to the world, you've been unfortunately forced to be confronted by the content I create. I like that. That's sort of like a goal. <laughs> a goal is right. You want you want to achieve a love. You want to make it so much content. People are seeing it by accident. I really appreciate that. Right. Hi. <laughs> Hi, hey, Chris. Hi, you? Kenya. Good to see you. Hi. I'm so glad you're back. I'm super excited to chat with you. <clears throat> yeah. Me too. Yeah. It's good to see everybody again. Love, love, move on. Are, yes. Look, it's a dark time. And what yeah. I appreciate about this, this is a dedicated, ferocious, yet wholesome energy. And I like yes. that. I like yes. that. We need that. We need that. I, I, I promise you, I've not heard those words put together ever before, <laughs> but I am happy that okay, you good. have put them together. Um, right, so good. thanks so much for coming back. You know, um, we had such a great time with you last time and uh, you gave us so much inspiration. You made us laugh and you, and we had such a great conversation with you. Um, I would love to just, you know, start out by seeing what you've been up to in the last month and a half since we last spoke. <laughs> what have I been, what have any of us been up to? You know, <laughs> no, I, you scrolling. Know. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, look, I think what I've been trying to do uh, is go to bed every night like the polls are right and wake up every morning like they're wrong. Uh, you know, at Crooked, we've been, you know, we've been putting out uh, um, a podcast to cover the news through Vote Save America. We've been trying to get more people involved, get people to sign up to phone bank, get people to sign up to text bank, get people to donate to some key races, both like yeah. the Senate race. Uh, house races, some legisl state legislative races. Um, so that's really what we've been focusing on. And me personally, what I've been trying to do is keep two competing ideas in my head at the same time, which is uh, uh, Trump can absolutely win. And that makes every day a challenge. That's real, mm -hmm. right? Internalize that. But if we all do our part, if we all actually turn out and step wow. up, uh, we will win. And there's nothing that he can do to stop that. And so I am hopeful and I am anxious. That is my mentality most of the day. Some days uh, the pendulum is like over here. Some days it's over here. Uh, most times, you know, it moves around. It moves around. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I get that. It is. It has been an eventful life. It's been an a <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> It's just, it's, there's a lot to go into. Yeah. <laughs> 2020 has like, been a long decade. That's all I have to well, say. You know, look, yeah. it was a, it was, here's the, here's the, something that's been making me feel hopeful, which is I remember the day after the inauguration, uh, when there were those incredible marches all over the country, the women's march, there was also later soon after protests at the airport. And I remember thinking, I hope that this is sustained. I, I really like, I hope that we can keep this enthusiasm, keep people invested, get people to vote, get them to do the work. I really wasn't sure. I genuinely wasn't sure. Like, would the effort to tire people out, to undermine people, would that undermine democracy itself, undermine our faith in institutions, the chaos, the, 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 the bullying, the, uh, the abuse, uh, uh, would it be enough uh, to, to, to cause people to kind of give up? And here we are two weeks to the election. I don't think that they have. And that doesn't mean that doesn't that doesn't mean this isn't a tough fight. That doesn't mean that like the forces of propaganda and the anti-democratic movement that has taken hold in this country, uh, right. uh, that has sort of grown up inside of some of the more right wing and nationalist movements that have been part of our politics forever. Uh, that doesn't mean that they can't win. That doesn't mean that they're not dangerous. Doesn't mean they they can't overcome us. But right now, what I see is, is at events like this at, at, at phone banks on, and, and with lines of people at the polls, people at uh, um, people are turning up, they're turning out, they're doing the work. And my hope is that we can just turn up that, that pressure and keep up that momentum for the next yeah. two weeks, because um, uh, then I am confident that we will do what we need to do and get out of this thing. And then the work begins. <clears throat> then the work begins. And that's so, that's so uh, on time that you said, you know, folks are getting out there and voting. You know, uh, we've been talking all these weeks, this week, and every week through election day about voting, right? And we've been saying uh, on this live stream, we only have 16 days left to vote. Oh my goodness, it's like 16 days. It's, it's like, where did the time go? <laughs> um, and clearly the earlier that you vote, the better. So folks, if you're just joining, the first message is welcome. The second message is the earlier you vote, the better, and make sure you vote. Uh, so, John, I, I hear that you're working on a tool to help people fill out their ballot in an informed way. Can you tell us a little bit about that? 
and the work that yes. you're doing? Yeah. So, at Vote, so Vote Save America, you know, it's a place where you can volunteer. It's a place where you can find the best way to donate to some key races where your money will go the furthest. But it's also a place that we want to be a one-stop shop about voting. So you can check your registration. You could register to vote. Um, but what we just put up now as we're in the kind of final days, um, because a lot of, you know, registration deadlines have passed in certain places, is um, our ballot tool. If you go to votesaveamerica.com slash ballot, you put in your address and you can not only make a plan to vote, but you can make a, you can actually um, kind of uh, see a kind of cheat sheet for your ballot. Basically, it has the presidential race, it has your Senate races, your House races, your uh, local races, and it even and including some DA races, judges, judges will be on there. I think some a lot of your local races. There's a lot of local races. We did the best <laughs> that we lot. could. But yeah. <laughs> uh, what's, what's really important there, too, is um, we have uh, uh, ballot measures. They are written to confuse us. They are written to get people who don't who uh, aren't well versed in the issue to either um, vote against their interests, vote with the, the, the financial interests that are backing these measures or to get you to not vote at all because it's complicated and hard to understand. You know, we've got like these, there's really important ballot measures across the country. There's, you know, there's this, uh, you know, the ride sharing companies somehow found $180 million to convince California that they can't afford to give people health care, right? So like, there are really, really important things on your ballot. Legal weed on the ballot in Montana, right? Look, that thing, that legal weed measure, not only is a good thing, it may get us a Senate seat because people are going to wow. turn out to vote for legal weed. But so anyway, there, there's important, um, there's important stuff that's not getting covered a lot uh, uh, in the national news or at all. And there's some helpful information tells you who supports it, who's against it. So you can just be informed and know that when you go into the ballot box, when you fill out your ballot at your kitchen table, that you know what you're in for. That's awesome, John. I love that you have a tool like that. Cause my biggest thing is to really like, I just want to shake people sometimes and be like, local elections are super important. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So look, I think that's amazing. Like, like, can you just, reiterate that for me because like i'm not as graceful as you thought i was earlier but like why would people think it's helpful like why is it helpful to vote in our local races like not just in a general year but just of course i would say I'd say two two reasons uh there's many reasons but two big reasons one um local issues shape your life they shape your the, the the community that you live in often more than national issues do you know there's a there's a big uh, race for the uh, city council in Los Angeles that's going on right now. That has huge implications for this city, huge implications about affordable housing, about uh, mass transit, about uh, um, a, a host of environmental issues, uh, you know, affordability, a ton of issues are at stake in these local elections. And they, and look, we, we're in the middle of, we're in the middle of a democratic crisis. We're in the middle of a democratic crisis for a variety of reasons. Uh, but one of them that's, I think, uh, uh, really important that doesn't often get the attention it deserves is, Local news has been decimated. And so that means that a lot of, uh, like it used to be there were more resources for people to find out about this and more resources that would hold local officials accountable for corruption, for their promises, for hypocrisy. And so more, just at a, at a moment when uh, um, uh, local politics is under less scrutiny, your, your input, your value, it's only, gro it's only greater. And it doesn't, and, 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 and at a moment like this, when I think we're all kind of so focused on, the stakes for the country, don't lose sight of those local stakes. But the other piece of this too is, you know, there's a lawsuit going on right now to overturn the Affordable Care Act, right? Well, who's gonna, who's putting that lawsuit forward? It's, uh, it's um, attorneys general at the state level, right? It's officials at the state level. Look, we're talking about gerrymandering. Yeah. Well, if we yeah. win state legislatures, we can draw the districts so that they're fair, so that Democrats aren't uh, uh, having their votes diluted so that Republicans can entrench minority rule in states across the country. So national issues, uh, um, local issues affect your life. National issues are often begin as local issues. So it's incredibly important. Awesome. Thank you so much for, for saying that. I think that a lot, we talked about in our training series too, that like a lot of national groundbreaking things started from, from just local action. So we talk about like marriage equality, right? Like yeah. If it wasn't for the states pushing through. Um, so just keep that in your hat, y'all. Um, and I think that's a great way also to like talk to our friends and family about voting. This particular hour, that's what we're doing today is just how to have conversations with folks about voting. Um, so John, could you tell me about some tactics that you've seen that might have worked to help people like get over maybe some cynicism or just like frustration or just motivated them to vote? 
Yeah, I mean, one thing, look, I, um, I don't, I'm not an expert in that. I hear an adorable something. It may be a small person or a doll, maybe a haunted doll, maybe an animal. Maybe it's, a a haunted, it's a haunted squeaky ball, which I have no idea how my dog got to, but yeah. Uh, but so, and I, and look, that's part of life now. And I think it's great. I want more dog noises. It's we're all human beings in our homes and the, and pretending, pre pre pretending we're professional robots has been good for nobody. So I like it. I want more dogs in the shots. But so anyway, what I was going to say is, um, Oh, talking to people. So, uh, you're, I'm not an expert in uh, relating to other human beings. In fact, I would consider myself at best an amateur. So I don't want to give anybody like I have the answer, but I'll just tell you that one thing we have found in polling, right, is um, a lot of like marginal voters or people that have maybe been were first time voters or didn't vote in, in 2016, um, they know that Donald Trump is terrible. <laughs> that has broken through, but they're not sure about Joe Biden. They're just genuinely uh, unsure about Joe Biden and his policies. And you can tell them about Joe Biden's policies. You can deliver a positive message about a progressive agenda and what it will mean for people, especially in this economic crisis, especially at a time uh, when, uh, you know, we see how, uh, um, how monstrous the leadership has been. Uh, and then one other, one other uh, uh, thing we've seen over and over again is that for young people uh, who may not be persuaded to get on vote, climate change is an incredibly important issue and per persuasive issue when you just tell people uh, what Joe Biden's plan is, uh, and what the uh, and what uh, that that um, uh, what Democrats uh, have kind of rallied behind. You look, at whether it's the Green New Deal or the kind of consensus policy that's uh, you know <laughs> let's call it Green New Deal adjacent from from Joe Biden. Regardless, it's the most progressive proposal uh, uh, that a Democrat has ever offered, uh, and obviously it, it's in stark contrast to a president who doesn't believe climate change is real. So that's another place where it's important. And then I would just say. Um, meet people where they are, just be honest, you know, I, like we don't have to, like, if, if you're talking to somebody who's not sure, tell them why you're sure, tell them why it's important to you. You don't need to convince somebody and maybe you can't, but you can plant something. You can show them what's in your heart and what you care about. And you don't have to argue when you do that. You just tell them, this is where I'm coming from. This is what I want you to hear from me. And they might not say in that moment that they agree, but it might stay with them. It might, might plant an idea, it might plant a seed. And, um, you know, that's important too. Well, John, you know, I think, <clears throat> first of all, like, there's so much at stake. And, you know, especially when we talk about having conversations, there's, you, you, we, we did a whole training where we went through some of the tenets of having good conversations. And later on in this call, we're going to have a quick little, a quick little cliff note version <laughs> of that uh, and talk through it. But um, I want to thank you for like, just showing your wisdom on that, because a lot of folks don't have like the skills, especially to talk about all of the different things that are happening in the country. Like they, they might not have the know-how um, and know all of the policy things, but if the thing that resonates most with other people is what resonates with you, right? And yeah. like that's the thing you can talk about and it means something uh, to other folks when they see that. Um, I know that you have to go, but I would love just last question, like, like, what are your feelings and what are the, the things that you want us to leave today with, with just days, two weeks and some change uh, to election day? We're so close to the end. Leave it all on the field. Let's, let's, the last polls close in uh, Alaska, I believe at 1 a.m. Eastern time on November 4th. And at 1 a.m. Eastern time on November 4th, let's all be sure that we did everything that we could that we don't have any regrets, that, that anything we were in charge of, we did the right thing. Any agency we had, we used. That's all that we can do. That's all that we can do. Thank you so much. Sarah. Thank you. Uh, Thanks always, for having me. So yeah, good to see you. Thanks for the work dope. that you're all doing. Thanks for getting everybody on. Thanks to everybody watching this. Yes. For being in the fight. Let's finish this thing. Then yes. let's go we're to so sleep. Close. And then <laughs> we'll get to work. You know, that's it. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's Thank all you we so got. Much. I'm that's, gonna go eat some Indian food do. and watch the boys. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're what... gonna talk later about that because I love that show. We'll talk later. We'll talk. But... About, we'll talk about it. <laughs> Bye, Thank everyone. you so much, John. All right. Thank you all so much. Thank you, John. Um, we are gonna watch a quick video.
um, given to us. Kick it away. I often paraphrase Coretta Scott King, and she famously said, the fight for civil rights must be fought and won with each generation. Now, I think what she meant is one, it is the very nature of our fights for equality and for justice, that whatever gains we make, they will not be permanent. So we must be vigilant. And I think the second part then of her admonition meant, understanding it's the nature of it, do not despair. Do not be overwhelmed. Do not throw up our hands when it is time to roll up our sleeves. A true democracy should be about everybody being heard. Access to the ballot is one of the biggest challenges that we face. And until we pass a new Voting Rights Act, we've got to take to the streets. We're going to have to be ever more vigilant in registering people to vote and making it easy for them to actually vote. Move On has been doing such extraordinary work being so active in organizing folks and lifting people up and giving voice to so many issues that must be heard. Early in my tenure as a, as a senator, um, the Move On folks who were there when we were fighting on DACA and fighting for Dreamers, the level of activism was extraordinary. Fighting against this president's attempt to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. At the Kavanaugh hearings, Move On members were everywhere. I mean, just showing up and requiring the supposed leaders to be accountable. That is what Move On is, right? It's about a movement. Move On members are reminding their neighbors and their friends about the power of their voice and the power of the individual when connected to the collective to really move an agenda. I look, who don't love a good fight? I love a good fight. <laughs> right, if it's worth fighting for, it's a fight worth having. All right. Thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, if you are just joining us, welcome to the call tonight. It is going to be so great. Um, and for those of you who are like, what's going on? Where's the Hamilton cast? Stay tuned because the cast of Hamilton is coming up uh, a little bit later on in call. For those of you who haven't heard about our program that we've been running during this election season, our Mobilize to Win program, let me tell you about it. Uh, this year, we are empowering each other to support at least 10 people in our network. They could be family, friends, classmates, or just people in your community to form what we call a vote team, where you will navigate the 2020 election together. So vote mobilizers, those are the individuals who uh, bring these vote teams together, create a team of voters whom they commit to turn out um, in November. Well, you know, we're already voting, so it's now through November. Vote mobilizers support each other uh, and the folks of their vote team. Uh, in some states, you can still register to vote. Um, you can make a plan to vote. Uh, you can make sure you vote by November 3rd, 2020, which is election day. Um, and get three friends to do the same. So vote mobilizers, that is what they do. They make sure that we get at least three friends to come out and vote. They make sure that their folks vote by November 3rd. They make sure that you make a plan to vote. Um, and in some states, you can even still register to vote. Um, if you are a vote mobilizer, please take a couple of seconds to let us know that you're here. Uh, go ahead in the chat and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm here. What's up? Hey, Chris, how you doing? Uh, let us know. And I am excited to see it. I'm excited. I'm looking. I'm looking. Let me get some more. Some more folks. If you're a vote mobilizer. Great. And shout out to folks who are mobilizing and shout out to folks who are vote tripling. Those are folks who are getting at least three friends. Uh, shout out to you if you're getting folks to vote. It is really important that we all do our due diligence and get out to vote. So we are having a conversation with the cast of Hamilton later in the show. So make sure you stick around and don't miss it. Uh, now I wanna bring on another special guest, our very own Michael Crawford and Yoshi Sargent uh, from Task Force. So please take it away. I'm joined today by Yossi Sirjant of uh, Task Force, which is an amazing creative agency that works with artists, uh, creative organizers, uh, dreamers, uh, et cetera, to uh, help build community around social change. 
Uh, you've probably seen uh, at least his most familiar work, which is um, working with Shepard Ferry on the 2008 Obama Hope poster, Yossi. I invited you here uh, because we're starting a conversation with friends and family about politics. And you know, a lot of the focus of our work has been about how do we empower people uh, to express themselves around politics and the elections in ways that are gonna be authentic and real to them, but that are also going to be um, uh, affirming and that are gonna build connections with their friends and family. So can you tell us a little bit about how people can use uh, animated gifts or memes to start conversations with people about voting? And, and tell us a little bit about that project in and of itself. Sure, um, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. There isn't a conversation, in my opinion, more important than what we can individually be doing right now to get our friends and our families in to the fight with us. We've had an amazing group of hundreds of animators and illustrators who have been producing the most, like they're just, uh, you know, I'm gonna show my age here, they're dope. <laughs> Just, they're really good. Um, and they're all young people, mostly young people of color who are just crushing it. And they're just cranking out amazing stuff that you can you can put on your profile pictures. You can you add to your TikToks to show the world what we think and to try to convince our friends and families to pay attention and to look at the world maybe a little differently than they have been. So how do people touch it? How do people use it? It's super easy. It's already on their phones. It's already on their social apps. All they have to do is hit the little GIF button on Twitter or the little GIF button on Facebook or the little sticker button on Instagram and look for a term that makes sense to them. You want to talk about the economy? Type in the word economy. You want to talk about education? Type in the word education and see what comes up. That's great. Uh, yeah, because I think it's really true that, um, you know, gifts are the way that we are uh, uh, communicating with friends, uh, you know, how we're talking to each other, which I think is awesome and wonderful. And I noticed that during the um, the last vice presidential debate and the, the, the previous presidential uh, debate, um, there were lots of gifts and memes that were popping up uh, from your work, your team. And I was sharing them with people on my Facebook page, on my uh, Twitter feed. And I was noticing that it was opening up conversations where we were actually able to talk about um, what was actually happening at the debates in a different way. So are there some examples of gifts or memes or you know Instagram stickers um, that you think might be good icebreakers for uh, people who are watching uh, to share with their friends and their family as a way of uh, opening up that kind of conversation about voting? 100%. Um, you know, everybody shows up for a different reason. It's, it's not necessarily the candidate. And for some people, people Biden is that candidate. And for some people, Harris is that candidate. But for other people, it is an understanding that black people are being murdered on the streets. For other people, it is the fact that uh, nobody is seems to be concerned with the fact that you know our states are on fire and our climate is out to get us because we have been abusing it. Right? Uh, there are other people who are hurting because they have lost their jobs right now, and there are there are millions and millions of Americans who are in a bad way and are hearing about tax breaks and tax laws, but reality is, is where the hell is my stimulus check, right? And, and why are they not passing that thing? And so what we have found is instead of talking about politics, if you just, um, for example, I put up a meme recently and it said, that said, where the hell is my stimulus check, right? And what it does was like, oh yeah, I'm, let's relate it back to my experience looking at the issues and not necessarily the politics of it, relating it back to their, their, their everyday experience in life and where they're touched by government and where they're touched by um, the systems that government is either reinforcing or trying to tear down. That's where, that's the win, the sweet spot. Great, and I know that one of the, uh, the gifts that I've been using quite often is a great gift around uh, Black Lives Matter. There, there are a lot of those, in fact. And I've used some of those to uh, initiate conversations with uh, some of my friends 
about the importance of uh, the election as it relates to Black lives, especially uh, my friends who are uh, not Black. You know, and it was a way of uh, bringing up the issue and talking about the issue, talking about the election as it relates to me, their friend, versus uh, it being some uh, mythical issue that Donald Trump is trying to use to uh, divide folks. And so that was a great way for me to be able to talk to some of my friends and say, Black Lives Matter, and here's how it specifically matters to me. And it, uh, all of that conversation was initiated by me sharing some of your gifts. Um, well, thank you for doing that, Michael. And I would argue that it's equally as important for white people to talk about that very same issue. And it should be the number one reason right now why people are showing up and getting in those early lines and voting. The idea here is not to identify the, and trick people into paying attention, but to engage people where they already are. How do we not introduce people into a political conversation, but engage them in a cultural conversation? What does it mean to just be yourself and to have organically the conversation emerge in, in people's feeds where they want, where they're already comfortable. How do we creatively tell our friends and family what our plan is? All right, all the statistics show that if you show your friends and family what your voting plan is, I'm gonna vote by mail. I'm gonna go early. I'm going on Wednesday. Would you like to come with me? I'm gonna walk to the vote. Whatever your plan is, if you declare your, make a plan, declare your plan and invite others to make a plan, that is how we win. We win by making plans, showing up and then bringing people with us. So if you can do that in a creative way, if you wanna make a TikTok video about that, if you wanna draw it um, in, a, in a piece of art, if you wanna write a poem about it, whatever your version of creatively making a plan and expressing it to the world out there and telling your friends and family visually that you are going to vote, that's a win. So thank you so much for joining us. And more importantly, thank you for uh, giving people tools for gifts, the memes, uh, the fun, creative stuff that they can use to talk to their friends and family about voting. I think it's um, uh, really important, especially as we're thinking about uh, younger folks and people who may not be getting, you know, like uh, uh, MSNBC breaking news alerts on their phones. So thank you so much, Yossi. Oh, I totally appreciate that. Um, I am uh, just one person amongst a whole um, squad of amazing creatives and activists who are generating this work that um, is really, 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 really beautiful. And if you want to find it, you can find it at uh, giphy.com backslash into action. Awesome. It takes a community and you've built a community of creatives. Thank you. And I'll talk to you later. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Michael Yoshi. Really appreciate you going deep in there with us. Um, really appreciate all of your work um, and all the things that you have going on. Thank you so much. Uh, for all of those of you who are, uh, just joining, just go ahead in the chat and say hello. If you have been here for a minute, go on in the chat and let me know that you're still here. Say, hey, I'm here, just let me know. Uh, I am so excited uh, for these uh, live streams that we're doing next week and over the course of the, the rest of these live streams, we'll be having several more special surprise guests, including next week, Representative Ayanna Presley, uh, Senator Cory Booker and Mark Ruffalo. So go ahead and make sure you RSVP at moveon.org slash power in action to make sure that you don't miss the place. Okay, you got to be in the room where it happens because Cam Hamilton is going to be coming up soon. Again, make sure that you go on to moveon.org slash power in action uh, to make sure you don't miss any of our special guests. And if you're still here with us, go ahead in the chat and just let me know that you're still here. If you just join us, say hello to folks. So, you know, have a little conversation. Uh, now I would like to turn our attention. Let's hear from one of our amazing Move On members who you might recognize, uh, who through their tireless help, helped to make everything we do he happened here at Move On, and I. This is really close to my heart. Um, so let's look at this video together. 
Our entire family got infected with the coronavirus. My mother, who was 75 years old, did test positive. A couple of days after I did, she went to a routine doctor's appointment, and from there she was taken via ambulance into the hospital. And that was the last day we got to see her. I don't want any other family to have to go through that. I don't want any other family to have to have a virtual viewing. I don't want another family to not be able to say goodbye. It's scary to know that the United States is such a powerful force and we are literally last in handling human life. I can only say that we're doing more than anybody in the world by far. The reason we are, how bad we are, is because the person who's the occupant of the White House decided to play an ego trip on the U.S. and people are dying daily because of that. Here's the bad part. When you test, a, when you do testing to that extent, you're going to find more people, you're going to find more cases. So I said to my people, slow the testing down, please. What would you have done differently facing this uh, crisis? Well, nothing. I don't take responsibility at all. The systemic disparities are very apparent in this pandemic. As we know, black and brown communities are usually at the front line of, of all of this. Then when we talk about the pandemic in, in a prison, well, we also know that the disproportionate amount of black and brown folks are incarcerated. My parents were Cuban refugees and I was always taught that your voice is super important and that's why they made their journey to America. A big part of my upbringing and what was instilled in me was, this is a place where you can use your voice. Like, you won't get hurt for using your voice. And that was just such a long-standing lesson. So my mom was very vocal. <laughs> there was never anything that she couldn't get done. She was definitely a firecracker and willing to jump in, and she was a stable at all her rallies. Um, one of my favorite pictures of her is kind of holding my bullhorn, and she's just yelling at someone. <laughs> so she was definitely engaged and always encouraged others to be engaged. And that was, I think, just a long-standing impact. Um, I'm definitely carrying that on, and I think she inspired folks to do the same. We would always go vote together, and it was just like, you know, this is what this is about. This is freedom, and you have to fight for it because it could easily be destroyed. And juxtaposition to what's happening now, I think that's one of the biggest motivators is that we are literally seeing what hundreds of thousands of immigrants have fought and died for to be here and what Americans died for to secure these rights are vanishing. And that's tragic and devastating. You can't just stand by and let that happen. I found Move On in the mid 90s with some petitions and just kind of was attached ever since. Um, it was always a way to be active, even if it wasn't locally. More recently, we had been focused on the elections, training folks on canvassing, getting information out about why it's important to vote, asking people their stories about why voting is important, helping folks just in every aspect of organizing, how to tell your story, how to um, just learn where to get information and just getting people excited again um, to kind of get rid of that hopelessness that could kind of sink in at times when you feel like you don't have any power. What makes me hopeful is that we have seen such a change in what a lot of us um, were used to, what democracy looks like, what it needs to look like. That light has been shined, really focusing on, we could really do this, like we could take this back. Our voice is so powerful that why would they work this hard to, to silence us? So we have power. And that's my message to everyone I talk to. No matter how you can participate, you doing one thing different to help us get a better tomorrow is going to be how we're going to win this. Um, hey, everybody. Um, you know, every time that video plays and I think about it, um, I think about the honor that I've had over these last few years of knowing Kenya and over the last several months working with Kenya, and I can say that she is all that that video portrays and more, and um, a true testament to the work 
of folks who really give a dog on about this country and who fight beyond themselves um, because uh, Kenya definitely is someone who goes above and beyond and and pulls from within herself to do it. You don't even have to ask Kenya. So I just want to take this moment to say thank you, Kenya, for all the work that you have been doing. Um, and, you know, for the, 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 not just the work, but the spirit that you give, because, you know, we need, sp <laughs> we need energy and spirit and help and everything else in these times. And when we see the work that you're doing, even through the hardship, even through having COVID, and still here fighting and, and, and training people on how to get engaged and stay engaged, I just, I would be remiss if I didn't just take a moment right there to just say publicly that we are in all of you. I am personally in all of you. I will talk for myself. Um, thank you so much for all the work that you do. I just so appreciate you. Um, and thank you to all of you who are here with us. Um, if you're still with us, go ahead and let me know in the chat. Thank you for all to all the Move On members for all the work that you've been doing to volunteer. Um, if you would like to become a Move On member, uh, you can sign up for our email or SMS at moveon.org. Um, it's real simple. <laughs> it's part of the day. Uh, go on to moveon.org. And you can text POWER, that's P-O-W-E-R, to 668366 to get to help get three of your friends to vote and sign up to become a vote mobilizer at mobilize to win.org. Again, let me say it again. You can text power that's P O W E R to six, six, eight, three, six, six to help get three friends to vote and sign up to be a vote mobilizer at mobilize to win. And don't forget to stick around because coming up very soon, uh, we're going to be having a conversation with the cast of Hamilton. Uh, so I can tell you it's going to be a really, really good uh, conversation. You don't want to miss it. Uh, with that, I want to bring back uh, the wonderful, the dynamic. You've seen her. She is, she is just, oh, my heart is full. <laughs> um, Kenya, to talk to us about voting. Thank you so much, Chris. I'm honored every day that I get to. Um, work here with who, people I consider family. So thank you so much. And thank you so much to my Move On community for your support. I saw y'all in the chat, thank you. Um, this is a real moment where we can channel our ancestors because we do have power. Um, so we're here to show it. So thank you all so much for being here. I'm sorry, I'm not Hamilton. Um, I'll be here shortly. Although if you've ever been in the car with me, it does feel like Hamilton. So I just felt like I needed to say that as well. Um, so I just want to take a moment and go over some quick mechanics about voting so we know what we need to do, right? Because there's no point in um, messing up our ballot, right? So we need to make sure that we're doing things 100%. So we're here to plan our vote. Now, shout out in the chat if you've already voted. Props. I'm in Las Vegas and early vote started yesterday in person. Um, so, all right, look at all our voters. That's wonderful. So we just wanna make sure that whether we're doing a vote plan for you or if you're helping someone with their vote plan, that we kind of have a step-by-step -step process just to make sure we can battle any challenges that might come our way. So the mechanics of voting is basically three parts. We have registration. So just so you know, in some states you could still register. Okay, so if you're talking to folks, and you ask that question that rolls off every organizer's mouth, are you registered to vote or your current address? So that could still be a thing, okay? Access is our ability to vote, whether that's vote by mail, vote early in person, or voting on election day. Do we have something that's accessible to us? And then the third part is counting. What does that look like? Can we track our ballot? Do we know that our vote was registered and therefore counted? So just to keep that in mind when we're thinking about how are we going to face these challenges on each level? So we know that we're in a pandemic that we haven't seen in this country since um, the beginning of the 1900s. So it's very important that we think about what role that plays in voting. So we wanna make sure that you have your um, protective gear, the PPE, whether that's gloves, mask, your hand sanitizer, all the things that you need. And remember to social distance. 
Now we've all seen those um, camera footage of long lines. Um, we'll talk about how to social distance there and do the best you can to protect yourself. So when we're talking about a plan, we're talking about is this plan for us? Is this for other people? What specifically do we have to do? When are we gonna do it? We're not just gonna say we're gonna vote next week. What day next week? I need to know y'all, this is serious. <laughs> and then where? Which specific site am I, vote, am I voting at? And then how? Um, so we had John Levitt here earlier talking about their ballot tool, making sure that we've gone through our ballot, we've researched our candidates, and we figured out who we're gonna vote for. And to help you through this process, we have two resources for you. Mobilize to win.org slash GOTV is a resource for you where you can actually fill out your vote plan. You could make it on the computer, you could email it to yourself or email it to your friend or family member that you're helping to vote. And if you're still stuck on maybe, how do I have these conversations? Maybe I want more information about what I'm hearing about today. If you go to mobilize to win slash trainings, you could take a look at our training series that we did in September in the summertime during um, preparation for Get Out the Vote. And we have hour long trainings on all these awesome sub subjects. So check those out and we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so we have vote by mail. So understand y'all that I know there might be a lot of ballots still outstanding, um, but we really wanna help you understand these deadlines. Um, so you need to look at your ballot, know if your ballot says mail by or received by. Those could be two very different things and this is meant to confuse us. So get your ballot in as soon as possible. For those folks that still have a mail-in ballot, we're recommending as move on to send in your ballot by October 20th. Just to make sure it gets there on time and you have any opportunity to correct anything that they might have brought up as an issue. So with that, when you have your mail ballot, you wanna make sure to complete it entirely. There are so many rules on different ballots. There might be an extra envelope or two envelopes or different places to sign. So make sure you're dotting your I's and crossing your T, filling in the ballot exactly. Um, we're not doing doodles or putting X's through. Um, we wanna make sure that we do it correctly. So our ability for it to be counted is elevated. Um, understanding whether we're gonna mail it in or if we have an opportunity in our jurisdictions to drop it off in a drop box um, or at a polling site. So again, knowing the rules for your specific state county is super important. And then tracking of ballots. So a lot of mail-in ballots do have a barcode on it that the USPS is able to track. A lot of states are using programs like Ballot Track to be able to report to you exactly where your ballot is. So again, ask those questions from your local Secretary of State, Commonwealth or Election Office. All right, let's go to the next slide. In-person early voting. So we just started our in-person early voting here in Nevada. Um, this is a great opportunity if you have concerns or you couldn't get your mail ballot in on time to vote. Um, now being that it's in-person, we wanna make sure that we are following the best we can um, our safety guidelines. So we need to know what time we're gonna go vote. Right? Don't just say I'm going tomorrow. What time? <laughs> do I need to bring you lunch? Um, do we need a dog sitter? Whatever, we got to plan it, right? <laughs> so understanding the time and location, some locations might have different hours depending on where they are. So looking into that beforehand is super helpful. Um, have a safety plan. Understand um, you might need to bring you need two different masks if you're waiting for a long time or making sure that you have all the medication you need. Bring a chair, y'all. You've seen these people standing in line. <laughs> so we wanna assume, we wanna prepare for the, for the scenario where we might have to wait for a while. So don't let that be a barrier. Do not leave until you vote. Bring a chair, 
bring your extra batteries for your uh, cell phone, bring medicine that you need, bring all the PPE. This is super important. Some places also offer accessibility options for folks that might be at high risk or have different, um, different needs that need to be addressed. So make sure you ask that. The poll worker can be your best friend in this situation. So make sure that you're asking those questions and don't leave until you vote, right? Pretend it's Black Friday, we out there, okay? Um, so that is the biggest thing that we need to remember is to be safe and do not leave. Um, next slide, please. So, like John said, this has been a battle. We're gonna leave everything on the field. Um, but what happens after election day? That is super important. So, we are part of the Protect the Results Coalition. So we know that on November 3rd, we may not know the results. And that is okay. Why is that okay? Because this is our election and we decide the election. So if we decide the election, we need to count every vote and we will wait until every vote is counted. So counting takes time, especially in a year. And someone mentioned this earlier in the chat where over 12 million people have already voted. How amazing is that? We're up almost 170% to the last election. So voting is taking time. So every vote counts and we may not know what happens on election day. Additionally, we have heard the occupant of the White House say that he may not accept the results of the election if he loses. it. So we need to be ready to protect the results. And to do that, you could sign up at protecttheresults.com. And say that again, protecttheresults.com to help us get ready to power through the next stage of our resiliency and taking back our, our power. And as a reminder on our next slide, if you run into any issues out of polling site, or if you have questions, might be a little bit confused, take your phone out, save this number, 1-866-R-VOTE. This is the Election Protection Hotline. And you could use this on the internet. You could go to one, you could go to 866rvote.com, I'm sorry, .org, um, or you could call them. And we have listed here in our awesome chat mods are putting in the chat, the numbers for all available languages. Don't leave it up to chance. There are no stupid questions. This is the fight of our life. Vote for those who aren't here to vote for themselves. Use your voice. And with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Chris. Thank you so much, Kenya. Uh, you know, look, we are here 16 days out. Now's the time. We've been waiting for it. Time to make sure you get out there and vote. Uh, to dig a little bit further into some of those conversations that we mentioned earlier and how to talk to your friends, family, loved ones, even your enemies about voting, uh, I would like to introduce Sonia Torres Rodriguez, Destiny Dixon, and Lilia Malfavon uh, two, two, uh, three of uh, Move On's voter mobilization strategists uh, for this election season. So take it away. Hey everyone, my name is Sonia from Move On. Uh, first, I wanna acknowledge the land that I'm currently occupying, which is Karankawa land. It is 17 days before the election and Destiny and Lilia are here with me. And we wanna to talk to you about our tips and tricks to talk to our friends and family about voting. Um, we're all young women of color on this call and we know a thing or two about advocating uh, with and uh, for our communities. And today we want to talk about what happens when you talk to a friend or family member about going out to vote and the conversation kind of gets derailed. <laughs> so that happens to me a lot and we want to kind of brainstorm together about how to get that conversation back on track, a uh, tactic that we kind of call re-railing a conversation. So derailing can be done on purpose or unintentionally. It includes tactics like criticizing how we're speaking, speaking in vague terms, or only being able to see things from one point of view. So this usually comes from kind of like a place of privilege. And it's important to recognize these things so we don't get kind of emotionally burnt out from pursuing conversations that aren't constructive. 
So Lillian, Destiny, can you maybe think of some ways in which your friends and family have derailed conversations about voting? I definitely have experience with this because I myself was a former cynic. And so when my brother, when I finally had that conversation with my brother, I'm like, have, are you going to vote this November? And he told me, no, what's the point? We're in California. Ah. And I remember having, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I remember having this shocked look on my face, but that's something I used to think before as well. So it's it, that cynical mindset. Like it's something that it's easy to have as like a woman of color or like people of color in general or as minority groups, you feel like your vote doesn't really matter. So, yeah. For sure, no, like as a young person, all my friends are super cynical, especially like a lot of them that supported Warren or Bernie. They're like, especially my Twitter homies, they're like, Destiny, we're not like, this isn't it, dog ain't it, we're not, we're not doing all this. But like actually going there and like having a conversation with them, it's like, hey, look, I know this wasn't your first pick, maybe not your second, but it's like, he's sitting here and he's actually trying to make changes and strides, like, you know, implementing strong platform points that really target young people and young people of color. So how can we, you know, does that, you know, maybe potentially change your mind and people start to realize like, okay, you know, maybe I could be a little less spicy on Twitter because maybe that could really change somebody's opinion that I don't even know. I don't know about being less spicy on Twitter, but <laughs> I have some ideas. Uh, Lilia, I think the thing with your brother is like so, so common. And something that's worked for me is, instead of like wanting to say a bunch of facts out to my sisters, I stop myself, I breathe, <laughs> and I try instead asking questions. So instead of saying, but, but voting is so important, I might say like, well, what might change your mind about whether voting is important or not? And that's a really good way both to get you kind of in a listening perspective, but also um, getting you to open up your mind and kind of consider other outside perspectives. And Destiny, what you said also is <laughs> super relatable. Uh, with the Warren stands and the Bernie bros, it can be really easy to start just kind of interrupting one another, both when you're texting or talking. Um, so derailing or a re-railing tactic could be maybe like a one mic agreement or agreeing to like, okay, I'm gonna let you talk. I'm gonna breathe over here and I'm actually gonna listen and then it'll be my turn to talk. And that way we stop kind of speaking over each other. And again, we can kind of come to like a, a consensus. Or those Twitter fingers, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so kind of just like letting the like bubbles kind of exist there to kind of keep them moving, but also like let them um, get their thought out. So another thing is like, these conversations can't just happen once, right? Like a conversation is a misnomer because really it should be like constant conversation that you're having. So uh, talking about a little bit more about re-railing, uh, what are some other thoughts that y'all have about things that have worked for you in getting conversations kind of back on track? So one of the re-railing tactics I've heard, and I actually heard it from you, was the what I hear you saying line of re-railing conversation. I think that line is like particularly effective because of what you said. It's it's empathetic. You're not being condescending. You're not being patronizing when you say that line. You're saying, hey, um, I heard everything you said. I'm taking it in. I'm taking it into account. And I understand where you're coming from. And because you're saying that, the other person becomes more willing to understand where you're coming from. So that's exactly what happened with my brother. I was like, I hear what you're saying. I've also felt that way before. Uh, but have you thought about how our local elections will also be affecting all of us and how the mayor we elect for our community is gonna determine whether we have toxic water and whether we continue to have toxic water in our community and um, also the education policies that are gonna go into place that will affect our younger cousins. And he was way more receptive to that because we, it was a back and forth, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, and just going off of that point, I had like a very similar conversation with my stepdad, you know, um, as a black man, he said, Destiny, the last time I voted was in 1998. And, and that's the only time I'm going to vote, right? I mean, you can't get me to vote again. Don't try it. You know, and he's like, politicians are crooked. They're corrupt. And, and, you know, his thoughts and feelings are very common to a lot of how a lot of people 
people, especially black men are feeling right now. Gary Washington made a really good quote the other day, right? You know, like black people feel, you know, I understand why you're frustrated. I understand why you like you don't feel like your vote matters, but I promise you when we, when we all vote, we're going to make a change. So definitely telling people we hear them and not just force feeding them information. Me and my stepdad like had like a two hour conversation about it. At the end of it, he was like, okay, I'm not going to tell you I'm going to vote, but I will tell you, you're, you're starting to change my opinion. And I think a great thing you brought up earlier, Sonia, it takes more than one con to have it's you know it's going to take multiple conversations to get them to maybe fill out that ballot destiny that was such a cool story because we all have our part to play in this election we all have that one person that we are responsible for you know as people who've decided that we're going to vote as people who have decided that this is kind of how we want to support our communities in this current moment that's so important because for you it's your stepdad for me it's my sister for other people it's their dad so um that's super important and thinking about really the current moment, right? What types of conversations are you having specifically about voting? So currently I have a lot of family in Texas, a few family members in Georgia, and they're in very Republican communities. And so I'm trying to communicate with them in a way that doesn't let them feel discouraged that they're in like majority Republican communities. And I think Sonia, you have something to say about that because I know that you're in Texas and you're facing a similar situation. So I was hoping you could speak on that so I could have these conversations as well and maybe you know convince them to go out and vote. For sure, yeah. I definitely have things to say about voting in Texas. I actually, <laughs> early voted um, this week with my family and that was really exciting. Um, but yeah, we are in a extremely Republican county and that can be discouraging sometimes because we feel like we're voting, but it doesn't really matter. Um, but what's actually even more striking to me is that I voted today, like I told you, and it took me like 10 minutes. And I had another friend who voted literally a county mm. over and they had to wait three hours in line yesterday. I've seen these videos online of like these like grandmas who are like out here with their chairs and their snacks. And I'm just like infuriated, but this is why the empathy point is so important because sometimes we adopt this like holier than thou attitude. Like, what do you mean you're not voting? What is so important? Well, voting is hard for some people. If I didn't know that my friend took three, it took them three hours to stand in line and they were like, Sonia, uh, I don't even know if I really want to vote. Well, their reality of voting is very different from mine. They might be in a place that is like voter intimidating them. And that doesn't mean that they shouldn't go vote. It just means that I, as a friend who had an easier time voting, have a responsibility to help them overcome those barriers because I'm even seeing some of my um, friends who are in college because I'm also a recent graduate who I could depend on them to vote but this year it's just harder for them and that's not the truth for everyone it's harder for some people easier for others but for the people who it's harder it might be people who are used to voting and who are usually civically engaged but suddenly they have a family member who's sick they have added responsibilities at home they're staying in a different place they had to re-register because they've moved um, and it just changes the whole process. So it's also important for us to remember to leave no stone unturned and make sure that we check with everyone in our lives, even if they're usually frequent voters, because something might have changed in this election that they need our support with. So that was so dope. Thank you all so much for talking with me. I hope this helped you and gave you some ideas. Lilia Destiny, you rock. And y'all, let's see it through. We just have 17 days, so let's do this. Ooh, we're at the finish line. I can feel it. Can... <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Sonia and Lilia and Destiny. Y'all are the dopest of the dope. Uh, I'm so, I just want to say to all of y'all watching, I am extremely lucky to be working with such talented folks. So thank you so much, Sonia, Lilia, and Destiny for taking us down that road. Um, I really appreciate it. That was dope, y'all, but guess what? Everybody here right now that is in the chat and watching this, you all are about to be in the room where it happens because here comes Hamilton. <laughs> I am so happy. I am glad that we are in the room where it happens. So I'd like to bring back uh, Michael Crawford. Now, first, before I bring him out, go ahead in the chat. And let me know that you're still with us, okay? I just need to, I need to feel it. We need to feel the energy from you. Um, i like to bring back Michael Crawford, who will introduce and lead the conversation with Terrence Woodbury and the cast 
of Hamilton, room where it happens. Last week during our Your Vote is Power, Power in Action live stream, we talked about how disinformation and misinformation contribute to voter suppression. This week, I'm super excited uh, because we've invited Terrence Woodbury, founding partner and expert researcher at HIT Strategies. We'd also like to introduce some amazing members from the cast of Hamilton, including Darnell Abraham, who has also played roles in Ragtime and the national touring cast of The Color Purple, and Lincia Cabere, who has been featured in the national tour of Rent and as a backup singer uh, touring with Beyonce, and Crystal Joy Brown, who is in the Broadway cast uh, for Hamilton, and who, uh, when we talked earlier in the week, uh, I gushed over seeing her in the musical Motown. And so I wanna kick off the conversation uh, with you, Crystal. Uh, you've done some pretty amazing work. I realized later that I watched you perform a number of times. Uh, oh, can you nice. tell me, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's great for me because you're a fantastic performer. And so can you talk to us a little bit of why uh, uh, voting and talking to people about voting is so important to you? You know, I grew up basically in our nation's capital. You know, I grew up 10 minutes outside of DC. Um, my 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 aunt went to Howard. Um, we're just a very, I, I grew up in politics. I grew up knowing that as a black person, it was always immediately impressed upon me that I had to make sure that no matter what, I was always engaging with democracy. It was always a big deal. My family all works for the government. I, you know, in, in some other reality, I probably would have become a lawyer. Um, and they wanted me to really bad. And my grandmother is still like, you still can do it. Um, but, you know, just the idea of of participating i think being like being raised with those values and understandings like that helped me to always be like socially conscious and aware of whatever platform i do or don't have to be actively in my circle trying to get people to vote because this is one piece that my ancestors fought and died for so i can't i can't i can't ignore the ancestors you know <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And I think one of the most important things to, to, you know, talk to black folks about is our vote is power. Uh, and one of the things that we've seen is that uh, black women especially are not only the backbone of the Democratic Party, but really influential uh, in terms of voting in the black community. Uh, Lencia, can you talk a little bit uh, uh, with us about why talking about voting is so important to you? I couldn't agree more with what all the stuff that Crystal was saying. I just think it's it's a privilege. It's our responsibility to engage in our democracy and voting is one of the ways we preserve it and we enhance it over time. And especially as a woman of color, I just feel it's so painful to continue to have the conversations over and over again about the countless injustices that are, that are happening and plaguing black and brown communities. And voting is one of the concrete ways we can contribute to making sustainable change in our country. Because like we were saying, like this, this isn't just, this is a right we have to fight for. And so it's, it just feels, it feels so empowering to be able to engage um, politically in that way, because it feels like, again, a concrete step to uh, some hopeful future for us to achieve. That's why it's important to me. Definitely. So Darnell, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, about you and why you're so excited about voting. Because you know we were talking a little bit earlier, and you were literally jumping out of your seat uh, with excitement uh, to encourage people to vote. You know, I uh, man, because it's personal. This is very personal. And and the thing is, uh, there is there's a history within our country where. Um, uh, black and brown people have been marginalized for years. And uh, this is, uh, I think this is a way of, of fighting back against that and saying, you know what, my voice counts. I will not be silenced. And so, uh, so I think it's kind of like the fighter in me, you know, that's like, you better get your behind out that door. You better go go vote. I don't care if you vote by mail. I don't care if you go to the bowling place, wear a mask, six, six feet, you know, uh, apart. But, but the thing is, you know, I mean, it's, it's uh, voting, it's, yes, there's, there's a duty, but there's also joy in it because like Crystal was saying and, and Lindsay were saying, our ancestors, you know, died and fought for the right to do so. So there's, there's a sense of, there should, should be a sense of celebration and, and joy that comes with it, but also a sense of reverence I, I, that I personally carry. My wife and I, we uh, were just filling out our uh, melon uh, ballots last night and just the um, the gravity, you know, of, of making my selections. Uh, it, it was, it was something spiritual, you know, about it. And so, 
So I'm telling everybody, man, I'm saying call your wife, call your husband, call your kids too, call your cousin, call everybody, call everybody, vote, just vote. Cause there's a lot of people who don't want you to. Um, and, and I really do mean that. I mean, we see that right now with uh, tactics and strategies that are at play right now where uh, there is this concerted effort to suppress uh, voters by uh, disseminating uh, disinformation or misinformation or misleading, misguiding people. Um, and that, that's offensive. You know, that really is offensive because for me, that says you're playing me to be a fool and, and I, I, I am no fool. So, uh, so I think a lot of, uh, of people in this country, I think that, that feel the same way. So uh, one of the best ways to rebel, one of the best ways to protest uh, that kind of foolery is to, uh, is to go vote. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So Terrence, um, you are a pollster, which means you have talked to or heard from uh, lots of folks, uh, including Black people, about voting. How does your research um, uh, compare with what uh, uh, Darnell, Lincia, and Crystal have just shared? You know, it's it, we're seeing the exact same thing. And I, I do, I feel like I have the luxury and the privilege to sit with young voters and Black and Brown voters every single day. I mean, I spend the last five hours of every day in focus groups with these voters. Uh, it is the best part of my job. It was a lot more fun when I got to do it in person and actually go into what I like to call America, uh, where real people live. Because <laughs> I also live in Washington, D.C. and grew up in Prince George's County. Uh, and so, you know, there's a, there's a level of information here. It's like the information bubble. Folks know about Amy uh, Barrett's, you know, Supreme Court confirmation hearing. And that's the kind of things that people follow here. But the average American and the average young American uh, just doesn't follow politics this way. What they do follow oh, yeah. is, uh, is, is, is are, the, are the, the pain that they feel, the, the uh, disappointment that they felt, felt from politics. And I have to, I mean, I, I'm just honest with these voters when I, when I talk to them in focus groups that it is a frustrating and oftentimes slow moving system. Progress doesn't always happen fast, but it is happening. And it, will and, the, and, and it will happen a lot faster when we engage. And I think that what we've seen over the summer through protest is what happens when we stand together, when we demand action. Um, and one thing that we've observed in this protest is that it really is, uh, you know, the movement for Black lives. It has evolved from a movement of Black people versus the police to a movement of young people versus racism. And we see the complexion of the protest changing. Right, we've been out there, we've seen it on TV. 54% of protesters are white. 32% uh, of protesters are black and they're Latino and multiracial, but the generational composition of those protests does not look like America. 85% of protesters are under the age of 39. This is young people standing up, standing together, and we have to do the same thing on election day. That's great. That's a really uh, exciting to hear. So Terrence, what are some of the messages that you've seen that are effective uh, in terms of helping young people uh, and people of color uh, vote? You know, one is one is protest, right? Like uh, a, a lot of young people and a lot of people of color feel connected to the protest, even if they didn't, even if they didn't participate themselves, because it was on all of our timelines. Everybody, had, you know, saw the signs held up and your favorite celebrity was out there. And it felt like something that as a community, we were all doing together. And for the first time, Black people felt like uh, that our, our voices were being amplified um, by, 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 the, by the allies and the many other people who are frustrated um, and, and, and getting to, and, and, and sick and tired of the system as it is. And so talking to uh, young people about how we have actually achieve, achieved change, police officers are being fired. Uh, jurisdictions are rethinking their budgets. It is working and voting while it will not solve everything. And I think this is where we've fallen short with young people is this transaction of if you vote, then your problems are solved. And that is not how it works. We have to vote and then we have to stay engaged. Um, but it is a part of our progress. And it is, a, it is a, uh, uh, the most important tool that we have to affect change. And the other message that we've seen work is a punitive power of voting. We could go fire people with our votes. You know, this ain't always about hiring people that we like. Sometimes it's about firing people that deserve to be fired, reminding them they work for us. And, and young people are very mobilized by that. There's a, there's a prosecutor in your city that need to be fired. There's a judge that need to be fired. 
there's a, a, a member of, of the state legislature that feel like they should be given tax cuts instead of funding education, go fire him too. And there's a president that, have, that has given you a whole lot of damn good reasons to fire him too. And so no matter what you feel about the person on the other side, your vote has the power to fire people and we should fire a whole bunch of them on November 3rd. Man, I'm just sitting over here, just like it's church. You know, I'm just sitting here, just, just sending, oh Lord, uh, <laughs> <laughs> man, fire. That 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 that's the word for the day, fire. Um, <laughs> man, because uh, I I just I appreciate you saying that because it's true. You know, it's we the people. Uh, this is a government that works for the people, ran by the people, and these are our representatives. And so. Um, we have to, like, I like how you said also, you know, you have to vote, but also you have to stay engaged uh, because voting doesn't solve all the problems. It's just, it's the first step in solving those problems, but it's a big step. It's an important one that it can't be bypassed. So Crystal, have you had uh, conversations with friends and family who may have been subjected to or uh, seen misinformation, uh, you know, for example, telling them that their vote doesn't count? And if you have, uh, how are you talking to those folks? Oh, wow. Yeah. Lots of conversations, especially like with my black family members as well, who have, that feel completely disenfranchised, completely like the system is completely rigged. And what I can say, and I'm sure like Terrence will have a thousand more answers for us. But like what I try to say is, you know, you might be voting for a politician per se, but go to their website and see what the policies are, because hopefully you're actually ushering in policy change and things of that nature. But just thinking about like, what was it? 70,000 or 90,000 votes really in key states that made Trump president. Yeah, and I think Donald Trump may have really screwed up because he should have probably disenfranchised black folks privately the way Republicans been doing. But instead this fool has gone on TV every day screaming about how he's, you know, how the votes going, ain't going to count and dumping them in the river and to, I'm going to stop the post office and, and black folks got time. And we see in Georgia in early voting, we see in Texas that black folks have all the time. It's going to take six hours. Good. Cause I, I brought eight hours with me and they're going to wait <laughs> and they got, and, they, and they're going to get it done. And I think that what he has created is a, is a resilience and a, and the stubbornness of black, of blackness that you're not just gonna tell me what I can't do, right? You're not just gonna stop me from doing what I know I'm supposed to do. I mean, this is the election that I would like to see 100% turn out from black people just to send a message to America. You, you got us messed up. Try this again, <laughs> try this again and we are gonna clap back. Now you, you, you better be racist in private because when you put this racism on TV, we are gonna have to clap back now. Uh, and I think that's what we're seeing. It's, it's a black clap back. And, and, you know, hearing that, uh, Terrence, I really think we need a Black GOTV program called the Black Clapback, uh, because that would be absolutely amazing. And I think one of the things that's also important to keep in mind is that, uh, yes, like turnout among Black voters, younger voters was down in 2016. But the real reason that Donald Trump is uh, in the White House right now running for re-election is because the majority of white people voted for him either because uh, they supported his racist views or because racism was not seen as a disqualifying uh, issue for them. Uh, but I think one, also one of the um, uh, most important stories of 2018 is the turnout among Black women. Uh, because Black women, uh, you know, let's just be super clear about that, are absolutely positively amazing. And I think that if um, uh, the rest of us uh, voted in the same way that Black women uh, uh, do, things would change. The whole game would uh, uh, change. And we wouldn't necessarily be talking about a Black clapback because we would have so much more of the things that we actually need and want. So, Lincia, um, uh, tell me a little bit about uh, your experiences talking to, to friends and family. Have you talked to folks who may have, um, you know, been targets or um, have seen some of the disinformation on social media that Crystal referenced a moment ago? This is the hardest thing because when I hear people who have been misinformed in different ways, like it just hurts me to my core, to my spirit. And so I just want to for lack of a better word, correct it. But I've learned that that's not particularly the most effective way to approach the situation because I feel that you lose your audience a lot of the times if you sort of 
attack people on their views. So I really try to take a step back and practice active listening. And although it's cliche, like seek to understand people before trying to be understood. And it's a cliche for a reason because it's freaking true. And I think if we take our time, I try to take my time to understand where somebody's coming from with whatever political view, however they feel about voting or not voting and all of the like, before I try to prescribe a solution, if that makes sense, because that helps me understand the origin of where they came to their, their understanding. And I just think it creates a safer space for people to share. Like, I just, I, I'm, try, I'm trying not to just shut people down because I don't think that's gonna create any change in anybody's mind or spirit. Um, so it's been a lot of like breathing <laughs> and a whole, like taking my time and asking a lot of questions. I think somebody m mentioned like saying, just asking why, like, where did you come to this understanding? Like what, if it's social media, like what kind of stuff have you been inter interacting with that have, has led you to this, you know? And that again, gives me just a truer understanding and helps me create a safer space where I can like continue to create a relationship with this person or this group of people with certain disenfranchised information because everyone's perspective is different. Like I, we, we call it disenfranchised or misinformed, but for them, it's them for whoever it is. It's, it's independent, it's grounded, it's informed, the exact opposite. So I just try to respect people in that and meet them at a place of compassion and empathy um, to their experiences, and then just sprinkle a little bit of the truth on top. And when it's- Actually, you know, <laughs> and I'm really glad that you said that because it is about, for me being a bridge maker, um, it is also about um, reaching across the aisle and having these uh, conversations, although difficult, yes, um, but, but also, you know, listening and trying to understand where they're coming from and then calling them out, you know, with love, um, and with compassion. And, uh, so that, that's another thing that I think is so vitally important right now. So I want to thank you so much for um, uh, uh, being here, for sharing your experiences, for uh, giving us some hope, some inspiration, some optimism in um, uh, this uh, 2020 year, which will undoubtedly go uh, down in history for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for helping to explain to folks that our vote is power. Uh, and uh, we will see you at the polls. Oh boy, I tell you, room where it happens. Thank us. <laughs> I am such a fan. I have seen, I have not seen Hamilton as much as some of my friends have, um, but I've seen it a few times and I am such a fan. So thank you to Michael um, for all your great work. Thank you for Terrence Morehouse, brother for all your work. Thank you to the wonderful cast of Hamilton for being with us tonight and sharing. I am so like full up to here with all the energies. I was in the room where it happened, can you? Oh, me too. And I, I thought I wasn't gonna be let in. I'm so excited. <laughs> so like, I just want you all to know that we will, we will continue to have uh, a special guest um, every Sunday through the end of the election. So keep coming back each and every week for more fun conversations. You can RSVP at moveon.org slash power in action uh, and bring friends, you know, bring bring everybody, bring your cousins, them, bring your mom. You know, we're all at home sitting around. Come and join us. Be here with us. Uh, a reminder to you that you can text the word power, that is P-O-W-E-R, to 668366 to help three friends uh, get out the vote and sign up to be a vote mobilizer at mobilize to win.org. Again, you can get three friends to vote by texting uh, power, P O W E R, to 668366 to help make sure you get the folks out to vote. Um, continue. All right, y'all, I'm feeling pumped up. I'm so excited. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. Don't leave just yet, because remember, this isn't just a moment, it's a movement. Stick with us to see a never before seen video of a rendition of Dear Theodosia. So don't leave. And also we want to see all the amazing uh, voting that's happening all over the place. So tweet at us, hashtag show us your PPE and let us know that you're voting safely. Yes. And yes.
So we are masks but not silence, y'all. Thank you so much. Thank you. And good night. Here's the video. Good night, everyone. Growing is important because everything that you hold dear, your friends, your families, your community, your dreams, everything that you expect out of this country hinges upon your voice. It shows officials who will hold them accountable. And show them that we matter and we demand change. Change in the areas that need changing. To fix what is broken and to uplift and highlight voices that aren't being heard. I consistently lean on and learn from the Black artists and friends in my life and I feel it is especially my duty to them to vote for leaders that will recognize their rights. It is one of the most crucial ways we can have our voices and our opinions heard and recognized. It is the most powerful tool we have to make a difference, not only in our lives, but the lives to come. Young voters especially because we make up half of the voting population. Now is not the time to stay. It's not a moment to sit and watch our country suffer from environmental issues, economic issues, gender, LGBTQ, and racial inequality among countless other issues and do nothing about it. Action is the ultimate confirmation of belief. People who look like me fought and died so that we would all have the right to be able to do so. It's a tangible way to combat systematic racism by voting for elected officials who believe in equality for all people. My ancestors fought to be a part of this democracy, to be seen as human and to have the same equal rights as everybody else. So many people have fought and died for your right and their right to vote. So take pride in that and make sure you're exercising your right to vote at every opportunity possible. We are democracy, not a monarchy, and we are not going back. Continuing to vote is the only way to fight disenfranchisement and to ensure that your own individual voice, which is so important, is hurt. You might be just sitting at home thinking, oh, I already know the outcome, I don't need to vote. Enough people are gonna vote anyway. But for all you know, a thousand other people could be sitting at home thinking the exact same thing. We might think, I'm just one person. How can I really make a difference? Collectively, our vote empowers us to install people into leadership who align with our values and our vision for the country. My vote is my voice. It's how we make our voices heard to build a better future for our country. It's my way of holding my voice accountable. Because if I don't, there's no way I can look myself in the mirror. We get to exercise our right and use our voice to make America a better place. I vote for my familia in Puerto Rico. I vote to end mass incarceration and police brutality. I vote to keep the arts in the schools. And I vote to get to see an America where everyone's treated equally, no matter where you come from, what your gender is, who you love, or what the color of your skin is. It's your right as an American citizen, and you want your voice to be heard, and you can make a difference on how this country is run. Every vote counts. It's our constitutional right. So let's change the world. Yes, we have so, so far to go, but it begins with your vote. Dear Theodosia, what to say to you? You have my eyes, you have your mother's name When you came into the world you cried And it broke my heart I'm dedicating every day to you Domestic life was never quite my style When you smile You knock me out, I fall apart and I thought I was so smart You will come of age with our young nation We'll bleed and fight for you We'll make it right for you If we lay a strong enough foundation We'll pass it on to you We'll give the world to you And you'll blow us all away Someday, someday Inside me now. Oh, Philip, you outshine the morning sun, my son. 
When you smile, I fall apart, and I thought I was so smart. My father wasn't around. My father wasn't around. I swear that I'll be around for you. I'll do whatever it takes. I'll make a million mistakes. I'll make the world safe and sound for you. Fight for you, we'll make it right for you. If we lay a strong enough foundation, we'll pass it on to you. We'll give the world to you, and you'll blow us all away. Justice is on the ballot. Justice is on the ballot when one in five mothers has hungry children. Justice is on the ballot when millions of people just lost their jobs, many of whom did not have paid sick leave, paid family leave, many of whom don't have affordable childcare. Justice is on the ballot when we look at the disparities around whose children and where they're living geographically to have access to broadband to be able to be educated at home, much less have a laptop. Justice is on the ballot when you look at the disproportionate number of African-Americans and Latinos who have been afflicted with and have died from COVID-19. Justice is on the ballot when people in our country are struggling like they are right now. So we got to get everybody out to vote. We got to take back the Senate. We got to retain our majority in the House. And we need to win the White House and elect Joe Biden.